So I was asked to to talk about um, spirituality and partnerships, um, and I'm going to focus more on the partnership side of things, and and um, specifically on romantic relationships. But I'm hoping that what I'm going to talk about will extend in interesting ways um, into other kinds of love relationships that are not necessarily romantic. Um, and hopefully that will resonate with what the other speakers are going to talk about tonight. So um, I'll tell you guys a little bit about me and my own experience and the things that I know. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll just go from there. I don't have like a really clear vision of what I'm going to say, so bear with me. Um, so when I was... Uh, 26 years old. So just a little background. So I grew up in, in rural America, in Virginia, um, in Appalachia, which is uh, an especially impoverished part of the country. Um, and I come from a long lineage of Appalachians, so farmers and coal miners. And um, it's also a really, I would say, conservative and homogenous part of the country as well um, and that hopefully will become relevant as I keep talking so basically um, I grew up in a really conventional American family and um, when I was 26, so I, I moved to Canada when I was 25, and when I was 26, um, my parents told me and my sister that they were gonna get a divorce. And while I rel realized this is a very normal thing that happens all the time, um, it was a really sort of um, challenging experience for me. Um, I felt a lot of grief, I felt like a lot of the things that I understood about how the world worked, but also things I understood about love and relationships and also my family and also who I was were challenged by that experience. So basically, um, my idea was that my parents were two people who were fundamentally good people. And I thought that if you were fundamentally good and you loved and cared about someone else, then you would not have any real problems with your relationship beyond the sort of ordinary things. So it seemed impossible to me that these two good people who made sacrifices for each other, who took care of each other, who really modeled the kind of relationship that I aspired to have, suddenly didn't want to be married anymore. And um, they weren't very able to explain why that was or what happened. And at the same time, I was in a relationship that lasted from about age 20 to 30, so about a decade. Um, and it wasn't a very good relationship. It was pretty turbulent. <coughs> we argued a lot. Um, I felt deeply in love with this person, but I often felt that I didn't like him very much. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I thought, well, if if my parents can't make this work, maybe I can, even though my relationship was like a disaster. I'm like, maybe that's fine. Um, but after a year or two, I started to think, actually, maybe I know absolutely <coughs> nothing about romantic love. Um, and I think that was true. I, I was really starting from scratch. Um, all I had was a lot of sort of cultural narratives that I had absorbed through things like popular culture, movies, music, um, fairy tales, all the sort of narratives that I had grown up with, my parents' love story, my grandparents' love story, and all of these things sort of gave me a, a collection of scripts, basically, for how love was supposed to work. And um, suddenly it felt like those scripts weren't serving me very well. So what I decided to do, um, because I teach first year university students how to write research papers, 
And I always say to them, oh, you can, you can write about anything. Um, academics will take any subject and um, there's research out there on it so you can find it. And so I thought maybe I should take my own advice and just do some research about romantic love. And so I wanted to do as broad of an approach as I could. So I went across a variety of different disciplines. Um, and I wanted to think about you know, love from a philosophical perspective. I wanted to know what psychologists had to say about what made relationships work or not work. Um, I wanted to investigate sociological theories of storytelling, why we tell love stories, what kinds of love stories are compelling, how those stories inform our ideas about relationships. Um, what else? I looked into linguistics, which I'm going to come back to, so how language influences the way we think about love, um, neurochemistry, what's going on in our brains when we fall in love or when we fall out of love, um, and I just wanted to like collect as much information as I possibly could and do so with the hope that I would like be able to make better decisions <laughs> when, it came, when it came to love. Um, and what I also think I was doing, maybe subconsciously, was trying to figure out a way out of the relationship that I was in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought if I could get some good data, <laughs> 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 then my brain would be able to override my heart. Um, and uh, I could just make better life choices. So um, that quest turned out to be fairly fruitful in a variety of interesting ways. Um, but the thing that I thought would be most relevant to talk about tonight would be um, think a little bit about the metaphors we use to talk about romantic love. Um, my background is obviously gonna be pretty American or maybe North American or maybe even Western, um, but I imagine that there are interesting metaphors across cultures and I would love to hear from those of you from other places about your own love metaphors because they're really interesting. Um, so a few years ago in the process of doing all this research, I came across an article by two um, Linguists, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. The article is called Metaphors We Live By. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but it's great. And I recommend uh, checking it out. And I have a copy of it if anyone wants me <laughs> to email you one later, just let me know. Um, but basically, what they argue is that metaphors both reflect our experiences of the world and construct our experiences of the world, right? So metaphors show what we think about something, but they also shape how we're capable of thinking about things. Um, so there is an interesting sort of circular logic there that I find really interesting. And um, before I found this metaphor, I had already started, I think because I'm an English teacher, looking at the metaphors that we use to talk about love. And one of the things that I noticed is that mm. most of them use the language of like illness, or violence. Um, so I'll, I'll explain some examples of that. So like lovesick, uh, heartbroken, <laughs> love struck, even like falling in love, um, yeah. or head over heels, or crushed. Um, <laughs> there's so many. And my, my favorite example of this is the word smitten. Um, <laughs> Which I always think of, you know, it's the, the um, past participle of the word smite, right? And smite reminds me of the book of Exodus from the Old Testament. And, you know, that the God was smiting the Egyptians, right? So it was like a plague of locusts or <laughs> a, a plague of boils, you know, just these horrible, horrible things. And so it's, it's so interesting to me that this is also the language that we use to talk about romantic love. And like the best 
theoretically most intense, wonderful <laughs> feelings of romantic love. And what all these metaphors have in common is basically that love is this force that acts on us, um, that we sort of have to submit to, right? So it puts us in a really passive position. Um, and as I was doing this research, I began to think that that passive position did not do me much good. Um, and maybe that's true for other people as well, right? So um, it really takes away a lot of our human agency. And, um, you know, that seems like a shame, especially for something that has such a big impact on our lives. You know, who we spend our time with, where we live, the kinds of things we do with our days, these are so often shaped by the people that we have relationships with, and especially romantic relationships. Um, so in Metaphors We Live By, they examine several different metaphors in the article um, about all kinds of different things, but several that they look at are uh, metaphors about love. And so these are just metaphors that exist in the English language. Um, and so love is uh, patient, right? So love is some form of illness or sickness. That's one of the ones they talk about. Another one they talk about that's really interesting is love is a physical force, right? So like gravity, so this is like falling or um, like love struck. So it's this powerful force that um, acts on us that sometimes like takes on the characteristics of like nature or physics. Um, love is a journey, which is a more constructive, positive one, perhaps. Um, but all of these metaphors are fairly limited. And one of the things that they're interested in doing in the article is trying to create new metaphors. And what they say about new metaphors is that in order to create a new metaphor, it has to already fit within the ideas that exist in the culture, right? So you can't, you can't say, you know, love is a, I'm trying to think of something that's like really at odds with romantic love, like <sighs> love as a food. <laughs> Um, which like maybe we could make some like love food metaphors, but they're more of a stretch for us. They don't necessarily match a lot of the ideas um, that we have in the English language at least about how love works. Um, but they did come up with a new metaphor for love and I really like this metaphor and I found it really useful for me personally in thinking about my romantic relationships, but I think it also extends really nicely into all of our intimate relationships. And so their new metaphor is love is a collaborative work of art. And they, when they talk about metaphors, they say metaphors have entailments, right? So these are ideas that are contained in a metaphor or implied by a metaphor. So like love as a sickness, that metaphor um, implies, for example, that love is a really powerful force that we have to submit to, something that we don't necessarily have control over. Um, so the entailments for love as a collaborative work of art, these are entailments that already <coughs> sort of fit with our ideas about love, but the metaphor as a whole can kind of reshape or maybe influence the way we practice love in interesting ways. So the entailments of love as a collaborative work of art are things like love is an aesthetic experience, right? So it can be beautiful. Um, love is creative, which I really like that idea. Um, love is collaborative, right? So it's not something that one person necessarily does alone. You have to have somebody else or maybe multiple people to do it with. Um, love is a sort of process that's ongoing, it takes time. Um, there's an element of figuring out what this aesthetic collaborative thing will be. Um, and all of these things are contained by love as a work of art, uh, love as a collaborative work of art. Um, so I really think this is a useful metaphor 
And one of the things that I really like about this particular metaphor is that I think it enables us to not only have a lot of agency, but to have a lot of collaborative agency and flexibility when it comes to our relationships, right? So we can think about it in terms of a romantic relationship first, let's say. <coughs> but like, if you're creating a work of art with another person in a romantic relationship, that might be a two-week fling at the beach. And it might be this beautiful, collaborative, interesting, surprising, very short, very intense work of art that you created with someone and then it's over. Or it might be a 50 year commitment to raising a family and creating a community of people and um, you know, growing together and changing over time. That could be a collaborative work of art. Or it might be um, one person who has multiple romantic partners, more than one, right? You could have a polyamorous version of a collaborative work of art. It could be a relationship that is romantic but not sexual. It could be a relationship that is long distance. All of these things are possible as long as the people who are participating in the re relationship are doing so in a way that's intentional and they're sort of figuring out the terms of that collaborative creative process together. And so I think there's a lot of, you know, it, it gives a lot of the agency to the people who are doing the loving. It takes away a lot of the power that these scripts that were handed come with, right? So my idea was that I had to practice love the way my parents did. And then when they divorced, I was suddenly freed from that script. And I thought, okay, I can do whatever I want. Um, turned out that wasn't necessarily true, right? Like it didn't work for me in the long term to have a relationship with someone I loved but didn't always like. Um, but we can sort of take these scripts and say, how are they working? What from this script do I want to keep? Right? What sort of ideas from my culture or my community about how love works do I want to keep and enact with my partner? And we can also say, you know, what are the ideas in these scripts that I don't necessarily want to enact? What are the things that don't work for us or that aren't necessarily important to us? And so one of the really appealing things about this collaborative work of art is that you have a chance to take your values and exercise them in really intentional ways within your relationship. And so to me, I thought this metaphor is like a really constructive and useful way to think about romantic love. Um, but since I've been sort of doing that with my partner, we do it in a lot of uh, really specific ways. Sorry, I'm just checking my time. So one of the things we do is we have a relationship contract and we sit down every year and we talk about like, okay, who's going to take out the trash and who's going to walk the dog on which days. And it also covers other things like, okay, is our relationship monogamous and do we want to keep it that way? Um, we talk about things like uh, how do we want to spend money? What do we want our relationship to be like with our friends? What are the things we want to be able to do separately? And what are the things we want to really intentionally do together? Um, and I really like this. This works really well for us. But I've also been thinking about the ways that I could practice this with the other people in my life. So with my parents, for example. Like I like the idea that we, my parents and I are continuing to collaborate on a relationship. And one of the ways that that's happened with my dad, for example, is that when I was younger, like I think many fathers and daughters, we had a, a relationship that he was a, an authority figure. And as I've gotten older, we've become more like peers. And my dad has now been divorced twice, and he's got a new girlfriend. 
and he was here, he was visiting me in Canada over Christmas and talking to me about his girlfriend. <laughs> and it was so exciting to him that we could have a conversation about <laughs> <laughs> a personal relationship and, and talk in a way that was like really meaningful. And so, you know, I, I really like this idea that we as individuals get to recalibrate or readjust or recreate or reimagine how we want to love the people that we love and that, that could be an ongoing process and that the relationships we have can change and we can influence how they change and we can do so with intention and kindness and compassion and um, you know hopefully love in a way that is more egalitarian and more purposeful than the narratives were handed about how love should work. And I, I think I'm close to my time, so I'll just stop there. But like I said, if you want the article, let me know. Or if you want to talk about love metaphors, <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs>